We're back with more from Liz Wright on Metro Scene. A voice of simple beauty that called up from distant days. He turned like a fly. ministers, you know, men and women. So uh, it just goes way back. And um, so I, I didn't do that. And so I have really kind of been responsible for my own path, you know. Um, after a while, the very people that my parents uh, were probably most concerned about as far as their opinion, you know, family and, and church folks, mm -hmm. when they got on board with what I was starting to figure out about myself and what I was doing, they were okay, because those are the very people they were concerned about. <laughs> it's not like they didn't love right. me, but they weren't but, sure yeah. how it would read, you know, to, to their public. Mm -hmm. And so um, once that cleared itself up, they were okay. And I don't, I don't feel a way about it. It's okay. I remember the first show that my mom, dad, and brother came to in Atlanta. And uh, they, my dad said, okay. I think I understand. You are you're mixing things, but you're still taking care of people. Okay. And this is art. He's like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> wow, sounds like you have a great family. And uh, I do. Is it, did that have anything to do with your move to Asheville, North Carolina area, which is my second home? That's where my mother was born. Wow. And, uh, it, did any of that upbringing have anything to do with that, or was it something else? Absolutely, Marvin. My upbringing had a lot to do with me moving back down south. I left Brooklyn, New York um, eight years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a seven-month stint, a chef's training program at the Natural Gourmet Institute uh, in the Flatiron District of New York. Mm -hmm. And I graduated in May uh, 09. And when I graduated, uh, I, I, I had said uh, one day in, during the course, I'm going to move and live on a mountain and I'm going to grow my own food. You know, because I, I learned about you know, Masanto and like what's organic and not organic. And I, I was, I cried that day. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that I am the first generation of my family um, that can't grow their own food. And I was like, I can't be that, you know, mm -hmm. I have to go and grow my own food. So I grew up eating a lot out of the garden. In fact, we were harvesting and planting mm -hmm. a lot <laughs> and weeding. <laughs> But I, but I missed that, and now that I was cooking, I wanted to know where things were from. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, I moved to North Carolina very shortly Mountains, after. Yeah. yeah, and really started learning how to grow food and keep a garden. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, I love it. Yeah. It's very, <laughs> it's very calming, and I have to say, I like cooking and I like growing food because um, it's an opportunity to practice order, like natural mm -hmm. order, okay. process. So I sometimes will go out to the garden and come back in and take a business call that I, or a conference call or make a decision about something. Mm. You know, I just try to make sure I spend time, you know, outdoors.
I'm a runner. Um, I practice yoga. I have my mat in the room. Um, and I just, I just try to keep, I really try to treat my mind like a garden. I'm very conscious of what I'm thinking, um, of what I'm listening to. Um, I can really monitor where I'm going. You know, when I start to shade over and the vines of like, you know, worry and anxiety and anger will try to get to me. You know, I, I do something about it. Like, pretty, I take it head on really quickly because I think it's important. I think our thoughts have so much to do with um, what we create and how we experience life. There's a lot that we cannot control, but it's amazing the amount of influence we have over our interpretation and our experience. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just very aware of that, and I'm exposed to people. I care about what I am bringing to them. You know, I got to be clear. <laughs> Talk about some of your music. Uh, I know uh, "Freedom and Surrender" is uh, very lately, but you've had some other great music too. Talk about some of that and what inspired you. Well, I have to say, Marvin, the um, contemporary gospel movement of the 80s and early 90s was a big influence for me. I grew up listening to, like, the Winans family, the Hawkins family, Rance Allen, you know, all of them. And they could take the sounds of, of any of the genre and talk about the Lord. But they, that was really their sound. Nobody can sing, like, soul, disco, like Rance. Right. <laughs> I mean, oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, yeah. So... I learned then, really, how to, to sing anything. I mean, and nobody can sing the gospel like Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. You know, her Amazing Grace record is my favorite, you know? So, and I think that's the best groove in the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on Holy Holy, on that, oh my goodness. So, mm -hmm. I think that's where it came from that I could hear um, this, the same voices cover different styles. Um, and it really gave me a really wonderful way to deal with my spirituality. They could sing about God, but it sounded as better than what my friends were listening to, but the same. You know, there'd be like R&B and all of it. Mm -hmm. So I think the contemporary gospel movement played a, a big, big role. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was in school uh, singing choral music, uh, old American folk music. And then I, and I went to college for a year and a half at Georgia <laughs> State. Um, okay. I sang classical voice yeah. and continued in private studies after I left school. So it's... Uh, Whatever this is, whatever this soup is that I do represents mm -hmm. like real honest uh, influences, a real, a real merging. Any jazz singers or composers that you would say kind of in, in, inspirations to you or people that you would, if you wanted to go to a concert, mm -hmm. whether they performed 40 years ago or now, mm -hmm. who, would, who would you say they were? One of the first singers that I learned about and saw live was Abby Lincoln. And I love Abby Lincoln because her voice um, reminded me of the voices of the mothers of the church. It sounded exactly the same okay. to me. And also, um, I started to learn that the sounds that I'd heard, the melodies and, and just the place they came from and people or sentiments was now called the blues, you know? So Abby Lincoln's style was really amazing to me because she was telling stories. Mm -hmm. She was sharing wisdom. She was writing, um, and yet she was in the in the jazz you know arena and absolutely belonged. But there was something about her voice that just it carried me over into this world of jazz, and I felt like it was something I could do because there were pieces of gospel and pieces of just the focus of, of sacred music that I recognized, and I never I never felt lost. You know, all of my transitions were really gradual, and I was also hanging out with musicians in Atlanta who played in church on Sunday, in the clubs during the week. So the merging of these influences has always been present. So I don't know. You know, if I'm a mutt, I come by it honestly. Tell us a 
about your latest music and, mm -hmm. and what's important about that music to you and to your fans. Sure. In short. Well, I really enjoyed making the record Freedom and Surrender. Uh, I wrote a lot of it with the producer of the album, Larry Klein, and with David Bateau. And so my days were really spent hanging out with them, you know, and I would go to the beach in the morning and run in LA, and I'd come and write with them for, you know, four or five hours. And I would do these uh, stints of like, I don't know, 10 to 12 days at a time. I probably did six of those. And, uh, and we wrote all this material. So the record represents a lot of really beautiful conversation and very genuine fellowship that we made time for. And it reminds me, Marvin, of a time where musicians really spent time together and it wasn't always about a gig. Or when it was a gig, but it was a regular gig. And I think some of our, some of our most interesting you know, works, iconic and timeless pieces, have come from people making time. So my moving back to the countryside is about slowing down and making time. And my pre-production process is now for making records is mm -hmm. all about slowing down and really making time. That's where the rich stuff is. I think I do better work in a state of interaction. You know, I really, I really enjoy people. And uh, I'll tell you something else. I saw something beautiful in an article the other day. Um, it's a piece called uh, "Humans of New York," mm -hmm. and this man said, "Who I, I don't know who he was." He said, "It's not art when people get so certain. Mm -hmm. When they get so certain that they are artists and that you know um, they know what they're doing, and you know, mm -hmm. he's like." It, the vulnerability is lost. Mm -hmm. The conversation is lost. The, the beautiful the questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm okay, I, and I don't, you know, stay away from clarity just to be ambiguous. But it is a matter of, you know, design and also of just observing. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be in strict control of it all to the point of like not waking up curious and not being in love with what I do. So I'm just thankful for. Thank you for this career and for the people's interest, because I have grown and gone across an arc in front of them. Um, but it feels like a real conversation, and that's all I ever could have asked for. All right. Well, we're thankful for you being one of our great singers in this generation. Thanks right. for joining us, Liz Wright. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on Metro Scene here at the Ram's Head in Annapolis as we talk to Liz Wright. So until next time, I'm Marvin Jackson for Metro Scene.